Steve, do you know if those worms that you found in the wood uh, can kind of live on any other substrate? Or how how do they find the wood in the in the deep sea? Or did they come out with it? I guess a couple couple of people have been asking about it. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, they they're a type of bivalve that kind of looks worm like, but they do have a shell and they uh, they are typically only found on woodfalls. There's a lot of instances like this where there's these species that we know they exist in the environment because we find them on the substrate that they like to, uh, or that they need to uh, consume or uh, reproduce on. Uh, so this most notably uh, are things like woodfalls, but also um, you know, whale falls uh, have unique communities unto them as well. Um, things that eat and digest the bone material and all the nutrients in the bone. Uh, so they, they are present in the environment. They get from one site to another. Uh, we know they have relatively um, fast reproduction potential um, to be able to colonize you know, a bone fall or uh, whale fall or wood fall or something um but it's yeah it's it's not really well established how they find their material they're looking for we imagine that you know it's not very common so animals that do colonize those things probably have to colonize them and reproduce a lot and relatively quickly um because the chances of go for it them spawning that's uh, actually their larvae to reach another yeah. woodfall is very, very tiny. Yeah. But so fascinating. But yeah, there, there's a bunch of different instances, like st certain types of sea stars that are only found on woodfalls, urchins, uh, mollusks, all sorts of really, really bizarre animals that are only found in these very tiny environments that are ephemeral. I had never heard of that before until this cruise. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, we uh, had the opportunity last year. We were out at Davidson Seamount and we sampled some more um, bone from a, a wood f or a whale fall we discovered the previous year. And um, yeah, there's really amazing animals that are associated with bone uh, woodfall or uh, whale falls uh, that most notably this one relatively recently described genus of worms called Osidax, uh, which uh, there's usually several species of sometimes in a, in a given woodfall um, that burrows into the bone and starts breaking it down, basically. Uh, and it's actually a relatively fast process because the first year we encountered the, the whale fall, it was, it was relatively fresh. There was bits of flesh still on, um, which were being consumed by the macro predators um, and the, the tritivores and things like octopus and crabs. Um, but there was the bone was solid. The subsequent year we came back, they had really broken down quite a bit of the bone. It became quite porous. You could take out chunks of bone. Um, uh, and, and yeah, a very, very interesting process that I hadn't worked with before, but bone, those... Uh, Bone-eating worms. Yep. Crazy. Osidex, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking them up right now. They're, they're kind of cool looking. Yeah, they have... Um, very distinctive male and female uh, morphologies as well. So within a given bone, you usually have to preserve the whole bone uh, frozen or something for later dissection because they're, if you try to pull them out, they just they tear and rip. So you have to just dissect them under a microscope or something. Yeah, they look like pretty deep in the bone from this photo I'm looking at, at least. Yeah, but. yeah there's a lot of energy in in these types of environments. If you think about it, the marine snow is kind of the most energy poor food source. Um, marine snow as well as you know, just what deposits on the sediments is pretty poor food source. 
for animals in the deep sea. So if they can adapt or be flexible with their feeding strategies and accommodate some things like this, um, you know, opportunistic food falls, uh, they could be quite successful. There is some very, I can't remember what year this was, maybe 2018 or 2019, where we saw a whale fall. Um, if you go on to probably just Nautilus's YouTube page, there's some really incredible footage of a somewhat fresh whale fall that um, our ROVs were exploring. And it's incredible to see all the different organisms feeding on it. And it, it's kind of haunted looking, but very, very cool. Um, and really tells the story of you know how much nutrients those whale falls can really bring back down to the deep sea. So you can see it in action. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, it was found by accident. So it gives you an idea. You can never know what you're going to find. Exploration at its finest. If we found something like that out here, there would be almost certainly new species associated with it. So, really? Yeah. Huh. We find that even, yeah, like Osadax, even, uh, you know, along the west coast, um, different species from north to south, uh, and then depending on depth also, you can have new species, different species. But there are issues um, with taking marine mammal, mammal products, um, even if they're on the seafloor, um, so it often requires a specific type of permit to remove marine mammal bones and products, so it's not always possible to sample them. Yeah, and I guess if you don't know you're coming across a whale fall, you probably don't have <laughs> yeah. the permit on hand. We often get uh, the question of what would be the coolest thing we could see, um, or new thing we could see as we're diving but now, which we've seen whale falls, but I've never thought about whale fall in a new part of the ocean and how that would definitely be space for new species add that to my list of cool things we could see or i shouldn't i guess because then we probably won't see it but. No, I didn't. Okay, I'll just double check it.
for listeners who may just be joining us, I see some new questions. Uh, we are currently descending the ROVs on our third dive of the expedition. We have been sonar mapping the last few days, waiting for the seas to calm down a bit, um, and we just launched about an hour ago. We are descending to about 3,300 meters in depth, um, where we will be exploring an unnamed seamount that we're calling Seamount F. Um, and this is the third seamount that we will explore on this cruise so far. Um, like the last cruises, we'll be looking for different geological samples, um, as well as exploring different deep sea coral and sponge ecosystems. We may be taking some biological samples as well. Um, but yeah, we will be transiting up the flank of this unnamed seamount. So thanks for tuning in today and probably be at the bottom in about an hour-ish. Um, so. Just got some blue water time. Please entertain us by sending in any questions. Um, and thanks for tuning in. Oh, and some people have asked how long this dive will be. This will be um, probably around a 24 hour dive. Steve, I've got a question for you. Which side of the seamount will we be exploring or ascending? I think it was the first cruise we were on the eastern si side of the seamount. Is that correct? And then northwest. And then what are we looking at tonight? This dive we'll be looking at kind of a northeast ridge, but it's a bit fragmented. Okay. Um, so the ridge extends off to the northeast, but it's broken into two pieces. We're going to be diving on the deeper portion right now, um, which is a bit disconnected. So there's a bit of a saddle. It drops down quite a bit and then picks up again. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, whenever you have these, these bumps in the seafloor at different depths, you often get different 
high density animal communities associated with them. So at this depth, we should be seeing different corals on this bump versus the, the, the main seamount. I'd be looking for differences between the two with respect to the biological communities. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it does provide an a, a interesting contrast to what we saw on the other two dives. Um, it would be nice to dive uh, kind of the south or, uh, or south or southwest faces, and that is probably going to be part of the plan for the coming dives. Gotcha. And are we just, we're kind of doing different sides of these seamounts for each seamount instead of picking like one seamount and kind of working up different ridges? Why do we do it that way? Um, you could do that. So that, that would give you really good um, spatial variation patterns for geology and biology at a single site. Um, seamounts are pretty patchwork uh, uh, environments. So you know, it's, even though it's they're all extinct volcanoes, they're not necessarily uniform on all sides and the current doesn't affect them on all sides equally. Uh, so you might end up with differential you know, crest precipitation uh, rates or compositions on one side of this is the other. You might end up with different biological community compositions that were associated with prevailing currents down in the deep. I think both both questions are really important. You're both diving on singular features, but also diving on multiple features um, because they answer help you answer different questions. Yeah. Interesting. Another question from our viewers. How are the living quarters on board Nautilus? Do you share bunk rooms? And yes, we all have roommates. We do share rooms, um, but they're pretty nice. They're not super spacious <laughs> by any means, um, but sharing rooms does allow us to get more people on the ship and we have uh, or can have up to around 50 people on the ship, which allows us to have our crew, but also um, a big enough science team to fill multiple watches throughout the night. Um, so yeah, they're, it's a pretty nice ship beyond the bunk rooms. We have uh, a back deck where we can hang out and eat meals. We've got a mess hall where we get fed three meals a day by our chef. Um, so yeah, we've, and then a couple of different labs. So uh, if you tune in, especially sometimes when we're um, not exploring, you can see some parts of the ship or kind of what it looks like from outside. but. Generally nice living quarters for a research ship. Another question from a viewer, viewer, what is Hercules' rate of descent? Um, on average, we usually go about 30 meters a minute um, for our descent. And if you actually go to nautiluslive.org, um, on the right-hand side, we have live data, so you can actually watch um, Hercules' depth and Argus' depth changing, so you can see where we're at as we're descending down. Um, and if you're also curious and learning a bit more about kind of some of those stats, you go to our science and tech uh, link on our webpage. You can explore um, both ROV Hercules um, and Argus. We've got all of those stats there. Um, so it says a little bit more about our descent and ascent rates um, and different elements of uh, these ROVs. So 
Always fun to look at those. Some of you are wondering how long before we reach the bottom. We are probably still about 40, 45 minutes from the bottom. Um, but you can watch our, our depth uh, going down if you go to nautiluslive.org on the homepage. Right now we're at about 2,100 meters. And we are going to be going down to about 3,300 meters in depth. Um, and that will be our target start for the dive. So at least you know where we're heading. Some of you wondering, uh, how long does it take for our ROVs to, or how long does it take for us to put them back into the water after we recover them? And that really depends. Um, we usually need some time to take all of our different samples out of Hercules. So we are often collecting, especially on this cruise, geological and biological samples. So we take those out um, and process those. And then it depends if we're transiting to a new site, depends a little bit on the weather. Um, 
few different factors go into when we'll be diving next. Um, so yeah, depends on our, our cruise objectives. Typically, if we have an idea of when we'll be diving again, we put it into our status on nautiluslive.org. Last couple of days, we've had some pretty big water. Um, so we've been waiting for that to calm down, which is why we didn't have our, our target um, dive scheduled for the next for the next dive. But hopefully we'll have some calmer seas for the next few days and can keep you posted um, from when we have the ROVs back on deck to when we expect to put them back in the water. So Ashley, while we've got some blue water, I've warned you of this. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us uh, a little bit about your ocean science internship, how you got the internship, but then also what you were doing with your graduate studies while you were on land. Um, you know, oftentimes we get when we stream into classes, um, we have a lot of high schoolers and college students who are really excited about internship programs. Um, and the different types of kind of graduate school options there are. So we'd love to hear kind of your journey, but specifically what you're studying. Because um, I know typically yeah. you're, you're busy logging data when we're diving. So I'm going to take advantage of some blue water time to pick your brain. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, not really doing too much right now. Um, so I kind of heard about OET and Nautilus Live by watching um, a lot of the NOAA Okeanos dives at first. And I was like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And I watched it all throughout my undergrad. Um, and so when I was about to graduate, this was right before COVID, um, I was looking for some opportunities for um, postgraduate work and just a lot of internships and po possibly some jobs later on. Um, and so I applied to uh, come out with OET and they said yes, which I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing. Like it's finally happening. And then of course COVID happened and uh, had to wait a really a while until now. And yeah. it's definitely worth the wait. Absolutely. <laughs> um, very, very happy that I still have the opportunity to do this and super happy to be here now. Um, but in the meantime, I uh, applied to graduate school and I'm actually at the University of Victoria in British Columbia now studying um, how urbanization affects aquatic environments, both freshwater and marine. And uh, I just started uh, a couple months ago, so I haven't done any field work yet or a ton of sampling, but that's coming up this summer and I'm super excited for that. Um, so yeah, even though sometimes like life will take you on a couple different paths and it might not work out right away, eventually eventually it will work out. And that's, that's something that I'm, I'm learning as life goes on.
Yeah. <laughs> Pandemics are good at teaching you patience, turns out. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what sort of um, field work and sampling will you be doing? Or what's kind of the focus um, of your study when you when you talk about urbanization? What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so cities kind of change the way that um, the surrounding environment works through like pollution and other human actions and humans will be changing the landscape. So I'll be looking at how specifically like the growing population in cities and how cities are expanding um, might change like species and how species are behaving as well as the biodiversity of an area. So I'll be focusing on like freshwater and marine environments um, using a special kind of fish called the stickleback which is really Stickle cute and back. small. And um, it can be found in both freshwater and marine environments. So it's a really good choice to like see how urbanization affects all of these different environments. And I'll be looking at its body size, um, its nitrogen and phosphorus content, and a couple other different factors to see um, how urbanization changes not only the fish, but also the characteristics of the overall environment. So I'm very excited. I'll be going out sampling across Vancouver Island uh, throughout the summer. So I'll get to know the island really, really well. I'm very excited because it's so, so beautiful up there and uh, very, very happy to live there. <laughs> feel very lucky. Yeah, that's a beautiful place to do field work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm going to follow your uh, your research since oh. I live so nearby, but I'm, I'm sure there's some pretty big implications of your research too, just on food web dynamics. And as you know, being up there, there's just so much attention around uh, salmon and orca populations. Does that yeah. fit into any of your research at all? Or yeah, your I won't thought be process working. around that? No, I won't really be working with salmon. Um, a couple of the other people in my cohort do work with salmon, but um, no, I'll be focusing on stickleback, but it does have a lot of implications for um, other cities across the world. So even though I'm working specifically with stickleback, um, other cities might work with uh, different species that are similar to stickleback that kind of show up in all these different environments. And hopefully it can kind of solidify like the links between how cities are changing environments and work in some sustainable practices with like resource managers and city planners and policy in order to just create more sustainable cities and better places for us all to live. Yeah, yeah, I support that. That's great. Are there particular, maybe I already said this, but um, I guess like pollutants of interest or are you kind of looking at them across the board? Yeah, it'll be mostly um, across the board. So nitrogen and phosphorus are two um, of the main pollutants that we'll be looking at just because those are the most common in runoff from cities from like either um, wastewater or other human actions. And those generally have the biggest impact on the, the aquatic environments. So those are the two that we'll be focusing on, but we'll also look at maybe like some trace metals and um, also how cities might make water cloudier and that might change the behavior of species as well. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, some of that's sad, obviously, <laughs> but <laughs> good to understand, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I know just from living nearby in Washington, there's a lot of um, emphasis on upgrading wastewater treatment plants um, and addressing kind of stormwater discharges because of all the impacts of these really quickly developing areas like the Northwest. Um, but it blows my mind um, that some of these wastewater treatment plants aren't required to treat some of the chemicals that we know, yeah, um, or even nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, but I think some of it's having more studies in science to understand, you know, how do we like invest in infrastructure? And so really neat to hear that you'll contribute to the science that we can make good decisions about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'd love to keep us posted.
Got a question from a viewer wondering if we have a schedule for the dives or are they in flux depending on different objectives, weather, and all of that. Um, we have a tentative schedule uh, typically. So we have our expedition planned out across the year each year. Um, so this is the last um, cruise of the 2021 expedition season, but soon we will be sharing out the 2022 expedition season. So we do know um, pretty close to the dates of where we will be in different locations. Um, so that stays pretty standard. But then within that, um, yes, there's definitely variables about um, the weather is something that we're always tracking. Um, and then sometimes there's differing transit times, depending on how far away our different um, exploration target spots are. Um, so for this week, um, we've definitely delayed some of our dives based on weather. But typically, we can still kind of make some things work, shorten some dives at different locations to still reach our research objectives, um, or at least explore some of our areas of interest. But um, nothing is for sure in deep sea exploration, that's for sure.
to any new listeners joining us tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are descending the ROVs down for our third dive of this expedition. Uh, we started descending about an hour and 45 minutes ago, so we're getting pretty close um, to the bottom here. And we are going to be starting at a target depth at just about 3,300 meters. And in this dive, we're going to be exploring the flank of another unnamed seamount, this time Seamount F. Uh, so those, for those of you who have been tuned in on our first dive, we explored Seamount C, then Seamount G, and now we've moved on to F. Um, and we will be doing a similar transect um, upslope from our beginning depth to the summit of a peak, um, trying to better understand the geology of the area while also assessing these deep sea coral ecosystems. Um, so thanks for tuning in. This is probably going to be about a 24-hour dive. Um, and I know a lot of you have been writing in that you're thankful we're back diving again. We are too. We had a couple of days of um, pretty big waves and water out here, so we we're waiting for things to calm down. And now that we've got it, we are excited to be back diving. So thanks for joining. A couple people are already asking, how fast does Hercules descend? Um, on average, Hercules is descending at about 30 meters a minute. So if you're watching on the nautiluslive.org webpage, you can actually see um, the current depth of Hercules and Argus. So if you like, you can always quickly calculate about how far we are um, from beginning or getting to the seafloor when you know what our target um, depth is, which again is about 3,300 meters. So we are getting there.
So Steve, since we're getting close to the seafloor, do you want to introduce yourself as the watch lead and maybe talk through some of our objectives specific to this dive? Sure. Yeah, we're uh, about a few hundred meters off bottom. Uh, we're diving on a new seamount that has not been explored. Um, in fact, uh, I think it, it had been previously mapped, but we did run a couple of lines across it to get some better bathymetry, uh, this expedition. Uh, but our plan for the dive, well, I'll introduce myself first. Um, I'm Steve Oskovich. I'm the watch lead and science manager for NA-135 uh, for the 12 to 4 watch. Uh, I am a researcher uh, in my own right at Boston University where I study deep water corals and their biogeography, diversity, and a bit about their ecology. Um, our plan for the dive today is we're going to start at about 30, 3,300 meters and work our way up to, um, uh, what's this, height of the first summit. It's about 2,700 yeah. meters. So we're, we'll, we'll work our way up about 500 meters or so um, to a, a high of a local summit, um, kind of a mini ridge. Uh, disconnected from the seamount, uh, exploring both the geology and the biology of the seafloor. Um, we're trying to characterize a few different things. 